Well, good morning and welcome to our Bible study. We're going to get started on Matthew 25 today. And it's great to be with you here on the internet and look forward to uh, those who are able to come to our worship service on June 7th. So keep that in mind. All right, let's uh, get started. Uh, We'll start with prayer, and we obviously want to be praying for our nation. Not only have we struggled with the uh, COVID uh, virus, but uh, now the unrest in our nation as um, uh, uh, civil justice issues are being brought up and uh, then... uh, On top of that, anger and riots that have come, we want to pray for God's peace and uh, his uh, grace to work through the hearts of all people. Well, Father, we thank you that um, today we can come into your presence and open your word and hear your truth spoken to our hearts. And we pray that uh, your words would be planted deep in our hearts and it would bear much fruit for your glory. Our nation, obviously, Lord, needs you in a desperate way as we have dealt with uh, um, the COVID-19 virus and uh, the fear that it has uh, brought into the hearts of many people. And then this fear continues now with uh, uh, the uh, riots that are going on and um, obviously... Uh, lots of comments on uh, social justice, on racism in our nation. And Lord, you are the one that can bring uh, uh, nations together, ethnic groups together. And so we pray that um, you would give us wisdom to see uh, our brokenness and uh, and, uh, for our nation to see its brokenness. And in that, seek your face and seek your mercy, your healing in our land. We seek you, Lord, that uh, our prayers may be heard, that our nation may be healed. Thank you, Lord, that you are here. And it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, as we continue here and again, Matthew 25, if you'll remember last week as we were talking uh, in Matthew 24, uh, there was uh, the... uh, um, Jesus was being challenged in some ways, Uh, well, 23. Then 24, he begins to talk about getting ready, that we need to be ready uh, for him. And and the end times was talked about in in 24. And I think 25 moves out of uh, chapter 24, obviously. And what uh, Matthew is trying to get at is is, uh, Jesus is continuing this message of, of being ready, and that's the point. Is um, we're, we're not um, we're not a people called to uh, uh, look at accidents, to look at crisis. Have you ever seen a, like an accident on the on the highway, or the road, and the traffic slows down because they, folks want to see what's happening? And and uh, and unfortunately, a lot of times, I think it's not that they're concerned for the folks, uh, though some of that may be there, but they just you just want to see, um, uh, yeah, there, there's an attractiveness to seeing something that's uh, not normal, that, that's intense, and, um, and, uh, and we can move in that direction with the end times. We, 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 don't, we want to hear the spectacular, we want to hear the... The devil's coming up. We want to hear the uh, pestilence and the floods and the famines. We want to hear all of this uh, stuff. In, in some ways, these tragedies are are exciting. Uh, obviously, that's where, uh, like a Weather Channel, CNN, that's how they make their money is to focus on the negatives and the bad things that uh, are going on. It keeps our attention. And... I hear Jesus saying that's uh, you know, it's not bad to hear news, but our focus shouldn't be on the tragedy, but what is our response to that? In, in chapter 25, we've talked about end times in, in, verse, in chapter 24. Now, Jesus is saying since we're, we're, your mind is on end times, on, on the, the, the second coming of the Lord, Let's talk about what your spirit, what your heart, what your mind should be focused on. And so let's begin chapter 25 here. And uh, Jesus says this, and uh, this is going to be key. The very first verse, then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable. And uh, so we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. So 
it, we may have had our minds on uh, the tragedy, the brokenness of the world, the destruction of the world. But God is, is moving us to now the kingdom of heaven. And so that is our focus, and it's really to get ready for that. So verse, uh, chapter 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in flask along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealer and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make their purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. And so this is Jesus talking about, all right, we're talking end times here. Here's how your heart, your uh, your spirit, your head, uh, just uh, you can be ready for the kingdom of God. And that's be ready, be prepared, be the prudent virgin. And uh, I'm sure you've heard sermons on the, the virgin representing the church. And uh, obviously, uh, people within the church, there are some that are ready and that are, that, that are prudent. And there are some that um, uh, are waiting to the last minute. I, I have to watch myself. I, I tend to wait for the, to the last minute, and I find myself running around quite a bit. And it's not a, a fun place to be, and I, I want to quit that. And obviously, here, uh, this can move into some tragedy if, if we don't have our, our hearts towards the, the Lord, uh, there, there's going to come a day when we say, oh, we can wait to another day. It can wait to another day. That, that There's no more days to wait. And Jesus is saying, if you have this attitude of, I don't really need to be in a relationship with God. I don't really need to be waiting for my bridegroom. I don't need to be prepared for his coming. Um, that day is going to sneak up on us. And then Jesus is going to turn because our actions through up to that point to the end times it has been, we're not really concerned about you, Jesus. And Jesus is saying, that attitude is going to tell me, your actions tell me, you don't know me, nor did you want to know me. And that should wake us up right there. And, and so, uh, you know, we've all had days where we, we've not felt close to God. But when these days become years on decades, um, there's a problem there. And, uh, and so we need to be near to our Lord. And he continues on to uh, being prepared um, for the kingdom of heaven in verse 14. And Jesus says this uh, in a parable form. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey, and immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more, but he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground, and he hid it, his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of the, those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful s slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And also the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted me two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. 
And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talents in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But the from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now this parable is uh, quite intense. Uh, and one of the first things that uh, I noticed there is that uh, there are different slaves. Now the, in the New American Standard Version, uh, they're not uh, colleagues. We're not called colleagues. We're called slaves, and that's a, a you know, especially this day and age, that's not a, uh, uh, a, a word to use even, uh, slave. But um, the, the I, I think the scripture is waking us up to uh, who do we think we are? We're not standing on equal grounds to God. We are His. Uh, servants, we are his disciples. Now Jesus says, "I call you friend," of course, but uh, the, I, I think uh, in this parable Jesus is setting up uh, a hard attitude within us that we serve God. God is our master, and that's the words that are used here. We're called slaves. God is called master, and um, uh, then talents are given, and. Um, and one we saw gets five talents, one gets two, one gets one. And uh, I think that's a, um, a way for us, uh, in my opinion, to see you know, we're not all created to be rocket scientists. We're not all created to be uh, big heroes. Uh, you know, we, we need to be content with who God has made us. Um, my mind goes to... Um, uh, the Lord of the Rings, a, a book that we uh, at the Starbuck household um, read uh, every now and again, and um, it, it's just there's some powerful imagery of um, of uh, Christian principles in in the Lord of the Rings. I, at least I think so. And there's one where there's an elf queen, and um, she comes con uh, confronts the uh, the hero of the story, a, a little fella. A little hobbit that's not uh, not very big. He's smaller than a man, and they, there's not much strength about them, physical strength. Uh, as we come to find out through the story, there's a lot of spiritual strength to these uh, these people. And um, in the section, uh, especially if you see this in the movie, it's uh, really a neat uh, saying that the the Hobbit has this powerful ring that can destroy the the world. That the you know, the world is going to fall if if this ring's not destroyed. And he he has it, and he's supposed to take it on a journey to throw it into a mountain to be destroyed. And um, he turns to the queen Gladriel and says, "I'll give you this ring if you ask me for it." And uh, in the books and in uh, the movie, is pretty decent job. Uh, uh, it shows her saying, "Oh, I can be this, and I can be worshipped, and and um, and uh, and it's like you could see the the imagery of the the queen and the actress just getting more and more excited about it, and then it's takes she takes a breath and says, "No, um, um, I will be content to be Gladriel, and instead of being worshipped, I will be who I was created to be." And I, I must refuse this because that uh, the ring is not my burden. I can help you on your journey, but I can't take that. And uh, it's just some wonderful imagery there. And I think I, I think about that little scene in the movie, in the book, uh, when I, I run across this parable here, that um, I think a lot of discontentment in the world is because... Uh, some of us just aren't content with who God has created us to be. And and it's okay not to be a president of the United States or a big position. 
uh, we, we need to thrive where God has put us. And a part of thriving, I think, is being content with whom, who God has made us. And so we see these uh, different uh, folks who have been given different talents, different skill sets, different uh, wealth. And um, uh, um, and they, they um, well, two of them do great. They invest it, and uh, they say, Master, here's your talents back, and here's, um, here's back uh, double. And uh, then the, the person with the least talents, and you think, oh, how sad. But I, I think Jesus is getting to a, a point here that you know, most of us in the world, we're not going to have five talents, two talents. We're going to have this, this one thing that uh, we're gifted in. And we see this uh, everyday man come back to God and say, I knew you were a, a hard taskmaster. And right there should key into us that we, we shouldn't feel sorry for uh, this, this guy with one talent. He's already made up his mind who God is. And he's, he says, God, you are cruel. You are this. <laughs> You're not a good God is basically what he's proclaiming here. And, uh, and then God comes back. Well, if you thought he's thought wrong, but if you thought I was cruel, if you thought I was a mean God, that I was unfair, then why <laughs> you should have been extra motivated to do something with this talent. And he says you should have at least put it in the bank so I could have got my interest back. If if I am who you say I am, then you're totally stupid not to have done that. And you're showing your ignorance here. And he says, uh, you know, you, you proclaim me uh, wrong, falsely. And uh, obviously he's proclaimed uh, uh, falsely to the world who God is, who his master is. And they said, my master is this. He's mean he's cruel he's a hard taskmaster and um and god's gonna not have anything to do with that uh, you you have proclaimed uh you have portrayed me to the world falsely and i i i will have nothing to do with that and and so he takes away uh the talents and says then since you have chosen to reject me and this is what's happened really since you've chosen to reject me then i'll take your talents away and i'll throw you out the uh, verse 30 throw out the worthless slave you worthless slave into the outer darkness and of obviously uh, imagery of of hell here into the place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and the gnashing of teeth is regret he begins to see the truth i was proclaiming a false god i was uh in opposition to god i was not of god okay verse 31 uh, continues here and and uh, mine's titled judgment verse 31 says but when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit on his glorious throne all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. And then he will say also to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. 
Then they themselves who will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, Obviously in verses 31 and 41, we're really just getting or verses uh, 34 down to 40 and then 41 down to the end here, we're getting um, almost the same words, but just a, a little change there. You didn't do this. And what was the rejection of God here? It was rejecting his people. It was rejecting the, uh, my brothers and sisters. And so uh, I've heard, uh, I remember in seminary, um, one of my professors always saying that our our, uh, our uh, vertical uh, relationship with God is dependent on our horizontal relationship with others. That they're somehow, some way, they're tied together. Our relationship with God is tied with our relationship with those around us, our neighbors, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, here we are as a nation struggling with that. How do we respond to our brothers and sisters? How do we respond to our neighbors? And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are choosing hate uh, at this time. And uh, we see what happens there when people choose hate. Uh, 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 they, there's no opportunity to have a relationship with God. If you can't have a relationship with those around you, uh, you're not going to be able to have a relationship with God. Uh, God ties those together. It's obvious right here as, as God says this. And he says these are things that you do that, that we feed. We feed the hungry. We give drink to the thirsty. And I don't think that, uh, obviously that's food, of course, but I think there's it goes deeper than that. That there's a feeding of the soul with the word, uh, the truth, and the grace of God, uh, uh, waters uh, are refreshing, and, and that the waters usually symbolize uh, uh, scriptures in in the uh, in the Bible, and um, and strangers. A uh, uh, stranger is that, that's not an illegal alien. <laughs> it's it's uh, strangers are people who might come into your country or into your neighborhood that you don't know that. Um, um, uh, there, there's a big difference. Uh, well, I'm going to get off track there, and I won't say too much more than that. But it's, it's folks that we're not accustomed to. It's uh, um, now strangers would be uh, would abide in in the laws. Uh, you know, obviously, if there are people that come in, like the rioters, uh, come in and and do something illegal, there's a different response that we give to them, at least biblically, than we would to uh, a stranger or one who, who comes in peace that's uh, in uncertain times that, that might uh, have a need that they can't fulfill because they're in a place that they, uh, they're they not accustomed to. Um, and so uh, it's, it's touching strangers, inviting them uh, into a relationship, and inviting to the home uh, if they're, they're naked. And again, I, yeah, that certainly can be bodily naked, but I, I can't help but think as I read this with spiritual eyes as well. Of, uh, uh, you know, people who are, are immature, not prepared. I think about some of the teachers that uh, tell me stories about some of the kids that just, they really are not, they should be at an age where they're a little more uh able to and equipped to handle the world but they don't have the skills yet and you know and a part of our I think our job is to help them find those skills to clothe them um, and, uh, and prepare them for the world and, and so and so Jesus said truly I say to you to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine and so he claims these people even the least of them you did it to me. And uh, he emphasizes even the least of them. So apparently the least are even more. Uh, uh, there, there's something uh, quite uh, important about these folks that aren't uh, as powerful in our community. 
a lot of times uh, folks who have no ability to contribute to society or to a church, they can easily be ignored. And we do it to our own peril to ignore those folks. And uh, then verse 41, I, I just want us to, um, it's the opposite of what uh, Jesus said uh, at the beginning, those who uh, take care of neighbors. Um, but verse 41, then he will also say to those on his left, and so there's a separation, those who have done and those who have not. But those on the left who have refused or rejected uh, neighborly uh, strangers, um, depart from me accursed. And he calls them accursed ones. They are the accursed. And, and listen to this, into the eternal fire. This is 41 again. Into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. He's talking about hell here. So, and and uh, folks have asked me about that. You know, how can a good God send people to hell? Hell is not prepared, as Jesus is saying right here, for people. We choose to go there. There are people who choose to go there. The, the hell was uh, prepared for, as Jesus says here, the devil and his angels. But uh, those who reject God, that's the only place that is godless, is hell. And so... Um, God says, all right, you don't want anything to do with me. You don't want anything to do with my kingdom. Then I'm going to send you to the only place that exists that is without me. That has, is, uh, there's the absence of God, and that's hell. Uh, and that's a choice that's made. Uh, people aren't sent to hell because God hates them. People are sent to hell because they choose to reject God. Okay, I'm going to end it here. At, uh, and again, this is Matthew 25. And next week we'll come together and uh, hit Matthew 26. Now, Matthew 26 is a big chapter. And you may want to go ahead and read ahead and uh, be prepared for that. But you have a great week. And again, uh, hopefully we'll see you Sunday at church. And it'll be in the Family Life Center. Uh, that, that'll give us the most uh, ability to do some social distancing and, and keep uh, folks as healthy as we can. And obviously, I'm going to do things on the Internet, continue to do things on the Internet. So if you're not comfortable with coming to church on Sunday, please stay home. And I will post uh, the, the worship service, a worship service on Sunday uh, for you to participate in. I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm working on what to do, if we can uh, copy the, the uh, service at, at, in uh, the sanctuary or in our worship time. But if not, I will certainly preach a, a sermon and, and uh, do as much as I can to, to bring in the uh, Sunday worship service in, at our facilities. But, uh, but uh, uh, please feel comfortable uh, um, uh, making a choice to stay home if, if you, uh, you so desire. We certainly understand that and want you to be feel safe and to be protected. Well, God bless you. Take care. Bye now.